You're listening to the 2018 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Program. This session features Morris G in conversation with Fergus Barryman. Kia ora and welcome. While this must be a record attendance, I, I think, for the Readers and Writers um, program, thank you all very much for coming. It's a very special treat that we have Morris G here today in conversation with Fergus Barryman from Victoria University Press. Big thank you to Paige and Blackmore, our sponsor, and I'm going to hand over to Fergus. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato. Thank you, Kerry, for the introduction, and thank you to the festival for inviting us here and for giving us the perfect platform for launching Morris's new book, Memories Pieces. Um, Thank you all for coming, squeezing in, and thank you, Morris. It's, it's great thank to you. see you here. So it's thank a... you for publishing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, the thanks is all mine. I mean, we will stop this soon, but, um, <laughs> but, but I mean, I don't need to introduce Morris, clearly. But, but what I will say is that Morris is absolutely um, central to my life as a reader, um, and after that as an editor and publisher. I have very strong memory of reading Plum nearly 40 years ago when it came out in paperback through Oxford University Press New Zealand and I was in my first year as a student at Victoria University and I read Plum and um, I have never from that day had any sense of a cultural cringe regarding New Zealand literature um, that a book could be as good as that coming from the next town or the next suburb of New Zealand has always seemed absolutely natural to me. And over the years, as I've read all of Morris's works as they've appeared, um, they, they've been a, a key part of my um, intellectual and emotional life here. Um, and so at this point in, in my publishing career, to have the opportunity to publish memory pieces has been a, a real thrill, so thank you, Morris. Um, and please, everybody, join me in thanking him and welcoming Morris G. We, we do have refreshments to follow, but we're going to make you wait for a little while while I ask Morris a few questions about the book. And also, Morris is going to do a few short readings to give you a flavour of this work. And I want to ask Morris by asking you about uh, this act, committing memoir, because earlier in your career you are on record as saying that you didn't want a biography and you weren't going to write a memoir. Um, and I'm extraordinarily pleased that you've changed your mind about both of those. And can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to that position? Well, I think it was largely that I was uh, um, emptied out of fiction, you know, <laughs> so um, I thought I'd better turn to the real stuff. And, uh, but I wrote the, the first part of this memoir, which is called uh, Double Unit, um, simply to the, to the memory of my parents, and uh, I had no uh, intention of publishing it. It was it was for the family and for the various generations if they were interested to find out um, something more about my mother and father, who I think um, were very interesting people. Um, my mother was, uh, oh gosh, how do I begin? Um, she was one of uh, the 15 children of a uh, Methodist minister and his wife and um, I don't know, it was one of those 15, she was quite lost towards the tail end of the family. But if you've read Plum, um, you will recognise when you read this, I've told the story of that minister in the book, um, that his life, follow, uh, rather Plum's life, George Plum in my novel Plum, follows very closely the, the early history of my, my maternal grandfather, who... Uh, just like Plum was um, questioned about his doctrinal failures by his church and forced to resign, it wasn't so much a, a heresy uh, trial as just an inquiry, and subsequently became a, a Presbyterian minister, um, just the way George Plum does. Uh, migrated with his family 
except one rebellious older son who wanted to go to the war, uh, or who decided he would go to the war, a brave thing to do in a pacifist family. Uh, my grandfather and his wife migrated to California with, with um, I think, 13, 13 of their 14 living children. And my mother had a part of her childhood in California and came back to New Zealand then. So and at that point, uh, you'd think that they could have some rest. Uh, but unfortunately, my grandfather was arrested by the police and charged with seditious utterance. Um, his seditious utterances were that he didn't believe that children should be taught to sing God save the king, they should be taught to sing God save the people. Um, <laughs> and he went on record as saying that uh, he hoped that we would soon have a revolution in New Zealand similar to the glorious Bolshevik revolution <laughs> which had just taken place in um, uh, Russia. Uh, so you see, he, he was an original and he was a gift to me for Plum. Um, but my mother grew up in that family as one of the younger daughters and she had a burning desire to write. And she wrote quite a bit. Uh, she published quite a bit. She published short stories in what I suppose has to be called women's magazines or were called women's magazines in those days. Um, one that some people may remember was called The Mirror. Um, and she published also in a left-wing journal called, was it Woman Today? Uh, which was edited, being edited by uh, Elsie Locke under her, uh, the, her name then, it was just Elsie Freeman, but she, she grew up to be known as, or rather she, when she was older she was known as Elsie Locke. Uh, quite a well-known writer. So my mother had a publishing career. She, she also published uh, um, a short story in a collection edited by Frank Sargison in 1945 called Speaking for Ourselves, and she was in very good company there with all the leading New Zealand writers. And Sargison, although she hadn't met him at that time, she was so pleased with herself that she began referring to him as Sarge. Well, I, don't know, I don't know whether he would have been very pleased. She had to conceal, mind you, that she didn't care very much for his writing. But, uh, anyhow, that, that's, that's the sort of career she had. I have to say that, very sadly, at the, after that story was written, her life did a kind of U-turn and she never published anything again, just as she seemed poised to take off on a writing career, various events came along, which, which uh, I've told some, I'm giving you some account of in this first part of this book. So, um, do, you, do you want to give us a taste of Lyndall's well, voice? Well, um, there were about 20 pages of her writing included in the first memoir in this book. Um, and they give a fairly detailed description of what it was like growing up as a child in a in a family of 14 with a father always in trouble and food short and various other dramatic things going on. But um, uh, I'll read you a little bit about that she wrote about just a, just a paragraph about her life, um, a, an incident that happened in when she was a pupil at Christchurch Girls High School. About, I think, about... Uh, that must have been about 1920, 21, when she would have been 13 or 14 years old. Um, where are we? I have to, oh yes, here it is. Uh, I got into trouble at school today. We have a horrid little man for physical drill. All the girls hate him. He says girls shouldn't wear stays or, or elastic in their bloomers, and to find out if they are, he feels them. He is a military man and a captain and comes all polished up in uniform to teach us drill. He, he is so small he looks silly. We nickname him Rooster. Today, a girl called Evelyn, who hates him most, 
wouldn't stop talking when we were marching in a big circle. Rooster stopped the march and made Evelyn come and stand in the middle of the circle and said, now to prove how uninteresting your chatter is, I'm going to ask any girl who likes talking to you to come out here. Nobody was going to until I did. <laughs> then everybody came out of line to talk to Evelyn. <laughs> and nobody was left to march. <laughs> Rooster went red and made me stand by myself in the circle and sent me to the headmistress when drill was over. I was frightened, but I was wild too, and told our headmistress that all the girls hated the drill master, but I wouldn't tell her why, because it didn't seem nice. <laughs> she just said, I think I see, and you may go now. <laughs> but, uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit of my mother's writing, uh, which, yeah. Cap captures her wonderfully, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the well, it shows how, how brave she was, yeah. I think, to do that. And yeah. Not many of us would have that. Uh, at a later date, uh, in support of her father, she refused to salute the flag at the morning. They had mm -hmm. to salute the flag every morning before they went into school. She was hauled up by a very kindly headmaster for that too, yeah. and, and he just gave a little nod and a wink and said, you can go into school early before assembly starts. Yeah. It's an interesting too, the way in that little scene, it takes her courage to sort of call the bluff of, of, the, oh, of, yes, of the, yeah, the master. Yeah, yeah. And then people follow. I mean, that's a very timely piece of writing a hundred <laughs> years later. Yes, I admire so much for that. But it's my father's story too. Um, my mother, when she grew up, uh, it says, by the age of 21, she had had two proposals, one from a school teacher and one from a Baptist minister, and she turned them down, both of them down, because, as she says in her writing, I was bewitched by a young carpenter in Tauranga. <laughs> and uh, the young carpenter in Tauranga was my father, Len G, who uh, appears on the... Now, there couldn't have been a worse time for them to start uh, a married life. Uh, that was... 1929, uh, depression and full swing, and dad was on relief and so on. And my mother tells wonderful stories about those days too, which, which I've uh, recorded here in this memoir of her. And dad, dad was interesting too. He was, I've called him a man's man, but he was, he was a carpenter, a very good carpenter. Um, he was a first-class amateur boxer who, uh, fought his way to the finals in the New Zealand champion, amateur championships and things like that. Um, and so, And although he had little understanding or sympathy for my mother's writing, he was, he was proud of her that she could do it. It was so clever, she th he thought. And um, to underline that, he built her a beautiful writing desk with turned mm -hmm. legs and inlays on the yeah. writing surface and things like that. So oh, he was sympathetic too, there's and a an, great guy, I have to say. There's a lovely story you quote um, of hers, and you summarise, where she imagines a car accident when her unsuit, or the, the character who's her, the unsuitable fiance is killed, and a burly fireman comes to the rescue That's and right, ends up marrying yeah. her. <laughs> a burly, burly fireman, or, or actually an engine driver from a, from the train that yeah. that kills the unsuitable boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> And he picks her up, and, and having picked her up, could never forget her, you know. So, yeah, she wrote that sort of story, but she could have been, I think, it's, a, it's not a bad story either. That's not the one in Landfall, the one, the one in Frank Sargison's collection. It, I forget what that's called, but it's very good indeed and should be read. She, she's a very good writer. Um, mm. you, you make a comment about that story, the, the engine driver story, that she's a little bit prone to sentimentality. Yeah. And, and I wondered about that because, you know, sentimentality is self in the codes of the time. And we have different codes for sentimentality yeah, now. That's right. Yes. And, and that, that bit of over explanation or wish fulfillment seems very genuine yeah. In, yeah. in your memoir. Well, he had to be a fireman, uh, sorry, an engine driver and pick her up because it's somewhere in the story this girl says, I like my men sweaty. <laughs> 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 but. Um, what happens? Uh, there's, a, there's a very nice piece of writing at the end of that story where she is 
in the maternity home, having just having had her first child, and she hears a train go past in the night, and then the whistle blow with a long sort of fading uh, whistling as it goes off into the distance. And this is her husband sending her a message in the night. I thought that worked it's, it's very lovely. well indeed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as an editor, reading that unfinished fragment, I was thinking, well, this is a completely a publishable work. Mm -hmm. um, if she had finished it, I'm sure she would have had it published. Do you know why? Or do you, without, without well, giving spoilers? I don't know. I think she perhaps sent that story somewhere and got it rejected. Mm -hmm. I have to say that she did publish a book, a, a book, a narrative poem for children called Mihi and the Last of the Mowers, which, is, which did very well and was uh, even read on the radio, and well, from which I could recite long chunks when I was a boy. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that's sort of of its time in a different way, mm, isn't it? It is. Immensely charming. I, I think your portrait of Lindell is, is a, a marvellously imagined. I mean, and you had the help of her writing to do that. It must have been a very different challenge to try and imaginatively embody your father in the memoir. Yeah, but I admired him so much. As, as kids, we, we really loved him. He, he, uh, I think the first thing I ever knew about him was that he had knocked men out. Uh, and in fact, he had knocked men out as a, as a boxer. And, you know, that went down very well with, <laughs> with three rough boys growing up, uh, three rough barefoot boys growing up at the end of the uh, Depression, just before the war. Yeah. It, it did strike me that there's a way in which the portrait of Lenin in, in the memoir has a kind of a warmth and acceptance of him that's, that's perhaps not quite there in some of the fictional portraits of men like him in, in the earlier novels. Do you think it's, I'm thinking of Fergus Soul, for instance, do you think it's taken you a while to really see your father? Uh, well, um, I've always admired him a great deal, uh, but later in his life he began to, he was a carpenter, he set himself up as a builder in Henderson, uh, west of Auckland, where uh, my, the whole, most of my childhood took place. And uh, he became Henderson's biggest builder in the boom that followed the war. And he worked really hard. And in a sense, we, we lost him for a few years yeah. while he was building up his business. Yeah. yeah. But, but he did build it up. And then um, uh, at that point, my mother had various crises of her own. So I think things went a bit a bit sour in the family at that point. It's all, it's all in here and it's, it's a mixed story. Uh, but I have to say I have great admiration and love for my parents and uh, without my father's generosity, I wouldn't have, for example, been able to go to university yes. or all those things. Yeah. Mm. Did you want to move forward a little bit and give us a taste of something a bit later on in the book? Well, let's see. Um, Oh, this, uh, this is a little bit about my childhood, uh, rather from the, the, uh, the, the part that gives a, uh, an account of my childhood. That part is called Blind Road because for, uh, for 13 years, the really formative years, I lived in a, in a blind road in Henderson, just a metalled blind road. Um, but uh, this is a little bit about, uh, about my early reading. Uh, this is a little bit unbelievable to me. Uh, I hope you'll think so too. Um, one day, Dad brought home a chum's annual uh, he had found on one of his jobs. It was fat and heavy to lift. Its cover was worn. The, the binding on the spine was loose and some of the pages torn, but it quickly became my favourite book. I read it for years by the fire, in bed, on the kitchen sofa. Its year must have been 1917 or 18 because two of its serial stories were about the Great War, with Haig on the Somme was one of them, and then a story, of, uh, a story about a, a, the crew of a British tank. Two brothers were at the center of the Somme story. I followed them through the book week by week as Shells exploded around them as they led bayonet charges and advanced in the face of machine gun fire. After one bayonet charge, the younger brother 
uh, finds his elder covered with blood. Don't worry, says the elder. It's not my blood, it's German gore. <laughs> gore, it, it horrified and thrilled me. And the tank advanced in its story week by week. You can see where we've been from the trail of squashed Huns. <laughs> it, was a it was a strange reading for the grandson of a pacifist and son of a, a pacifist mother. I did not know how deeply the fear of another war affected her or how that war, when it came, threatened her reason and eroded her good health, both, both physical and mental. She must have longed to take the chum's annual away from me. Mum, listen. This British soldier throws a hand grenade and it says, Private Schmidt's head parted company from his shoulders. <laughs> Don't, oh don't, Mum said, distressed and horrified too, horrified at me. And I read her no more bits from the chum's annual. Mm. Yeah, that was, yeah, no, uh, quite an interesting little thing here. I was, looked at her, uh, her, her own library and they were all to, the books there were, uh, were uh, all too old for me. I soon stopped looking and can recall only one title which puzzled me for years, The Maori Race. It was by a man called Edward Tregear. The Maori Race. I hunted through it, trying to found out, find out what sort of race it had been and who had won. <laughs> Uh, so it's, a, it's a lovely portrait of the growth of a reader. I mean, I, I can remember my shelf of war comics. I don't know what my parents thought about that. But it really doesn't matter what you read as long no, as no, you're as long as drawn reading, into yeah, that world yeah, of the imagination. Yeah, yeah. indeed. That, so. that theme, though, of, of your, your mother's high-mindedness and your earthiness is, is one of the key themes of Lion Road. Yes, it is. It is indeed. She, she was uh, a natural Puritan and she believed in, in gentleness and purity and all of those things. And she, uh, she didn't consciously, but she indoctrinated her children in, in that sort of thing. And so I got a very heavy dose of it. And um, it was, um, uh, I think it, it caused a kind of a fracture in, in my young life from, I had a very happy sort of childhood, carefree childhood. And then once reached pu once I reached puberty, I had a, a very tormented as adolescence, which is uh, also, which I has, I'll give some details of in this. But don't be scared, please, they're not too bad. <laughs> it's, it's wonderfully generous what you've given us yeah. uh, in this book. I'm just thinking then, you said before your mother's sort of decline after the story in the Sargison anthology. And, and so your fracturedness and her own unhappiness yes. are sort of coincidental, aren't yes, they? Yes, they were. There's, there's a lovely moment in the book where you say that you tried to write a narrative but ended up writing um, just anecdotes. Anecdotes, yes. Um, which, which I disagree with. Yeah, well, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, I've lost my voice. <coughs> you may have to carry on alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, because the way Blind Road proceeds is it's a lot of little dives into memory, a scene, a book, um, a sort of a memory of something that your brother did that was yeah. appalling to you at yeah. the, the age you were. And then from that, a whole lot of memories yeah. sort of flower. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm surprised that you remember so much so vividly when I look back to my childhood and is this something that, that you worked on as an exercise? Did, did this come about no, no, as a result of the writing? I think it just seems somehow to be natural to me. That part of my brain seems to, be, to have held up pretty well. I don't know what happened yesterday, for example, but uh, <laughs> uh, that part of my brain works pretty well and I've got a whole barrel full of, of memories to dip into. And I, they come out highly coloured, and probably over-coloured at times too. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful store and I'd hate to lose it. But there is a comment in your author's note um, that, that whenever memory came up against research and they were different, you went with memory. Yeah, yes. Can you give me an example? 
Well, in a way, I was really meaning dates and things like that and places, but uh, let me think. There's a, there's a, a given account of a, uh, of a, a fairly terrible event that happened at a swimming hole in Henderson where the creek, the tidal creek finished and the fresh water creek began. And uh, we had a diving board that pointed out over the, the big fresh wa uh, salt water swimming pool. Well, I was down there with my elder brother one day um, and his, one of his friends and a man and a two, two young men and two young women arrived and spread out a blanket and opened bottles of beer. And of course, we watched to see what we could see. And nothing bad went on, of course. Well, bad's the wrong word, isn't it? Nothing <laughs> natural went on. <laughs> um, but uh, soon enough, the guy, they changed into their bathing suits and he went out and bounced on the end of the board. And of course, we knew the tide was out. You know, uh, it's a tidal creek. He obviously didn't. And so we thought, well, he's not going to die. He's only skiting, you know. And he just did a high dive and dived into three feet of water. Um, and he came up and just floated on the surface. Now, my brother, big brother, and his friend ran screaming down the, the hill to the, where they were having their picnic and said, you know, there's no water there, no water there. And they, the, the man's friend and my brother's friend went in and pulled this guy out. And he lay on the blanket, obviously dying, because he had a broken neck. Um, and everybody ran off to get the police and the doctor, and I found myself left alone with just the two young women. Um, and soon enough, I, I watched the man lying there with, with his eyes open, just staring at nothing, and I was certain he was dead. Um, but then, then the police came, and uh, I ran away, you know, I got out of there. Now, Here's where fact diverges, you know. He wasn't dead. I found out recently from some research that your, si your sister Rachel did for the biography that, in fact, um, he died next day in hospital. Uh, so that's, but um, my memory insists that he died lying on the blanket. Uh, so that's one of those cases where, you know, I'd go with memory. The other bit of that is that the newspaper account said that the police went into the water and pulled the man out. Now, that's not true. Uh, my memory is clear on this, that my brother and my brother's friend and the, and the man's friend went and pulled him out. Uh, and I met my brother's friend at my brother's 80th birthday party many, many years later. And I said, do you remember the guy down at Falls Park diving into shallow water? And he said, sure, I remember. I pulled him out. So the paper was wrong. Now there's, uh, there's you know, memory serves, uh, but sometimes the facts are different. M m maybe yeah. the pa newspaper story was to make it a little bit more palatable to yeah. readers at that time and maybe. show the police a little bit more in control yeah. of the situation. It was a, a pretty dreadful situation, uh, well, obviously for them, but also for me. I'd have oh, been yes. about nine years old and to be left alone in that lonely place uh, with uh, a, a, a young woman kneeling beside somebody I thought was dead and rocking back and forth and crying and turning to me whenever I tried to leave and saying, don't go. And it was pretty horrible. That, that would change mm. you. Mm. So things like that have been put into the story. Mm. And uh, perhaps, perhaps I could just mention part three. Yes, and yeah. one, one thing I noticed um, with the book is that each part is half the length of the one before, which, which as we all know, is the same structure as the luminaries. So great tribute to your, to your craftsmanship, Morris. <laughs> I had to tell Fergus this morning that it was entirely accidental. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that, that struck me about the book is the way that you've written a memoir with as little of your present self in it as possible. That your well, biography of your parents, your childhood self, and then a biography of Margareta, and that's the story yeah. of your marriage. And it's not really the story of, of, a, of her marriage. It's Margareta's story uh, as a ch it's her childhood. Um, 
She, she, my wife was, was born in Sweden in 1940. I was Swedish from her, her mother was Swedish and her father was a young Scottish New Zealander who was flying for, uh, for British Airways on night, night flying uh, mail flights. And they met and, uh, and married and, and Margaret was born. But, but um, uh, you know, uh, her mother made a remarkable journey in 1940 from Sweden to New Zealand uh, when the German Germans were, had already occupied Denmark and Norway. She took her baby and decided to get to New Zealand. Uh, where she would join her husband, who was now flying, flying boats for Tasman Empire Airways across the uh, Tasman Sea. And she did a six-week trip down through Latvia, off into Russia, down through the Middle East, uh, down through India, um, none of which would have been possible if she hadn't still been breastfeeding the baby. Mm and finally got to Sydney where her husband met her husband again whom she hadn't seen for a long time and uh, he of course flying blew the flying boat that brought them back to Auckland yeah so that was very interesting but is there, is there time for just a yes, short, yes, short uh, thing I'd like to uh, do give you a little sketch of Margaret's father who was a remarkable character um, and uh, he went back, he came out to New Zealand from Scotland, um, didn't like it very much, worked for his father who had migrated here, went back to uh, England and bought himself a de Havilland Gypsy Moth. And then with only 32 hours flying experience, um, he was set off one morning from Croydon Airport heading for Australia. <laughs> he had a spare propeller strapped on the side of his plane, which was named Kia Ora, and he carried a bundle of clothes in the cockpit and a packet of sandwiches in a brown paper bag. <laughs> he was not even wearing a hat, his mother complained later. And his aim was to accumulate enough flying hours for a commercial pilot's license. Uh, a report from a British newspaper reads, Mystery Airman, a light plane landed at Croydon yesterday and from it stepped a young man who announced his intention of starting at 4 a.m. today on a flight to Australia. This morning he reappeared and after stating that his name was Oscar Garden and his home was in New Zealand, he climbed into his machine and flew away. <laughs> Aerodrome officials have no idea where he came from. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, Margaret's father, who went on to quite a distinguished flying career as he became chief pilot for Teal and uh, head of operations for Teal before he suddenly threw it in after an argument with management and never flew an aeroplane again. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's one of many fantastic stories in this book. Um, so thank you for the readings, Morris, and for the questions. Um, the, the, the modesty I was alluding to before, the way you sort of step out of the frame towards the end of the book is, is quite lovely and it reminds me of the way Frank Sinatra would end a concert, you know, he'd sing Angel Eyes and excuse me while I disappear and he'd sort of slip off stage. Um, but of course, he'd, not he'd, he'd, sing. He'd, he'd, come, he'd come back to a huge ovation from the audience. So please um, join me in thanking and congratulating Morris on a wonderful book. <laughs>